Yes. <laughs> we, uh, we've done this a long time now, and we've seen a lot of changes. We were just talking about Zoom, uh, the, the ubiquity of Zoom, and, uh, and that's introduced technology has, uh, has changed uh, a lot of aspects of the law in many ways, and, and that's state and federal law. In fact, in New York has a new um, deep fake and, uh, and right of publicity law that most people haven't heard about, but I'm sure we'll hear about some cases coming up soon. Uh, but in, in, in actuality, uh, a lot in law has changed, and a lot in practicality hasn't. So, <laughs> um, without well, further ado. Before, before we go, how many of you are producers? Are you a producer? So what do you guys do? I'm just here for the food. No, <laughs> no, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. You're a lawyer. What kind of law do you practice? I'm a business lawyer. Okay. And what do you do? Well, I'm a consultant. Okay. What do you consult about? As opposed to like an action movie with just explosions and I mean, look, you, you look at the success of Maverick and the reality is that there's a, I believe there's already a lawsuit related to that because uh, they're, they're trying to figure out if Maverick is considered a derivative work of Top Gun, which was based on an article back I think in, in New York Magazine or one of the, you know, USA Today or one of the. That gets into termination right and th they're arguing over that as well. Uh, but I, I actually think that uh, you see a lot of movies with uh, pretty good dialogue. And uh, I loved Everything Everywhere All at Once. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's um, fantastic film. Oh, 15 minutes may be too long, but um, I, I still loved it. And I thought it had a terrific script. So in terms of talking about legalities, it probably makes sense for us to build a movie from beginning to end, right? How long do we have, Jeff? Three, four. Um, an hour? Hour? Yeah. Hour? Yeah. 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 You want to go longer? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah. Just go until we count. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think that most of the people that I run into have a, either have a script or want to buy a script and turn it into a movie. Frequently at this place, the people who have a script want to make it into a movie for themselves. And that doesn't mean that you don't need a contract to turn it into a movie because while well, you may own that script because you are the author of that script, ultimately you're going to put it in a company which other people are going to invest in. And so you need a piece of paper from yourself to that company in order to get the rights from you to that company fundamental issue, a lot of people forget about it. You must have that piece of paper. So it's typically an option agreement, and if you are that person, you can make the terms whatever you want, but if they're two different people, if I own a script and Michael's gonna buy it from me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna want as much as I can up front on the option payment to provide an incentive on him to make sure that the picture goes into production. The more money he has at risk, the more likely he is to actually do something and turn it into a picture. Unless his purpose in buying it is to take the product off the market because he sees it as competitive to another product that he's working on. And that has happened to me, but in this world it's not likely. So what does an option deal typically look like? In order to answer that question properly for me, I totally disagree. You would have to look at what the budget of a picture is. Because if you think a picture is going to cost you $5 million to make, the option price is likely to be higher, or the price of the property, the price of the is likely to be higher 
than the price of a property that's going to cost you $200,000. So the option price is going to be tied to the price of the purchase price, and the purchase price is going to be tied to the cost of the picture. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, not. By the way, I should have introduced myself. My name is Phil. I am a film as well as a commercial producer. I just wanted to clarify something before we get a little bit deeper into the option paper. From what I understand, uh, at least what I think I should do, especially if I'm going to have a legitimate script or make it to the film, it would be best for my own protection to copyright that script immediately. And then I would create an LLC with that script or the movie production company name related to that script. And then technically sell it for myself to that LLC despite the fact that I own it. Is that correct, or, or is that well, a simplification? You have three steps you're talking about, maybe one of those right. Um, I don't want to so this is assuming that there is no option. We're, we're skipping the option stage. You're coming up with something right off the bat as a writer. Yeah. And so, yes, you would you would copyright that script after you uh, you create that script. You are its author. Um, I mean, it, it, and I remember you, years ago you did this, you had this great whiteboard presentation about uh, LLCs and C oh. corporations. Um, but in actuality, um, entertainment law is a term of art. It, it, it's, it's just an amalgam of different types of law. And, um, and depending on what you plan on using uh, a script for or, or uh, a project for, it can have a variety of uses and sometimes you want to protect, uh, pr protect the best asset, which may be the intellectual property. Right. So depending on the situation, if I, I have a, a client who is creating a whole bunch of intellectual property, I might have a separate LLC just as a, a holding company of that, of that intellectual property. Generally, you don't start out that way. It, it, it depends on how ambitious you become, how, how likely the likelihood of success, and how, how many employees you possibly right. end up having, so on and so forth, uh, can determine the number of, uh, of uh, entities you create surrounding, uh, surrounding your intellectual property and, and, and the projects you engage in. Generally, film projects are their own LLCs, while you may have a production company uh, that is its own S corporation. And the reason is, is because all this costs money. And LLCs in New York, especially, are costlier because you have publishing requirements uh, for LLCs. So uh, if you're starting out with, uh, with an original idea, and you write it down, and you come up with a treatment, and you develop that into a script, Yes, you would get a copyright. You would go to the electronic copyright office. It's, it's, it's sixty-five dollars, something like that. Um, I don't do that for clients; they do it themselves. But uh, you, you, you want to protect that script. Um, the next step of what you're talking about. First of all, I don't think you need to file a copyright. I really don't. Right, right, right. right. I don't think you have to right away. Right. Well, I would never tell you not to, right. but it's not necessary because if you're only going to send it out to 50 or 100 people, you put the word copyright on it and, and you're fine. Um, if you see someone has stolen it, then you'll get into action. Right. You can't stop someone from stealing it if you file a copyright. This is, it's not material. It's important to get a copyright, but you don't have to, it's not a requirement. Right. The second thing is, I personally, if I were your lawyer, I would tell you not to form an LLC if your plan was to sell the script to a third party. Yes. There's no need to. I agree with that. Because uh, the LLC does nothing for you as a writer. Doesn't. If you're going to produce the script yourself, in, in produce the script yourself, yeah. when you find someone who's ready to give you money, then I would form the LLC. Because the LLC starts to cost money to hold. Right. Right? Because if you form an LLC and you are the only member of the LLC, right. you don't have to file tax returns for the LLC. You can file it on your own personal but as soon as someone else becomes a partner, you got to file an account. You got to hire an accountant. You got to file tax returns. It becomes a new entity. It costs money to maintain. So I wouldn't bother until you're ready to start moving. So that's the answer to that question for me. Now, from a, a project standpoint, uh, a lot of producers uh, 
consider themselves producers of, uh, of various projects and various forms of development, that's where you would, you would form uh, some sort of entity. I usually advise clients as corporations because they, don't, they cost $125, they're very cheap. Um, and again, I advise them to talk to an accountant because it's not enough. And we, we forgot to do our, uh, our disclaimer, none, none of this constitutes legal advice. Um, <laughs> but um, the reality is, is that um, it's one thing to have one project, which from an odd standpoint is, is not in your favor. <laughs> You're, you're essentially putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, and then, you know, if you have the LLC, uh, because like I said, a, a film, a feature film generally is an LLC. Um, that's also, if that's also the company and it's not divorced from the operations of the company, uh, it can become problematic later when you do want to have uh, different uh, projects running under the same banner. but. Uh, it, it really depends on the situation. You're gonna hear this a lot from us. Uh, so much that we yeah. discuss is on a case-by-case -case basis, but you should be aware of the possibilities of when so it comes I've written a script. I think it's gonna cost $5 million to produce because my friend Fred told me it's gonna cost $5 million to produce. Michael wants to buy it from me. What should I charge him? How would we set that up? What would be a fair price for me to get for my script in a $5 million movie from Michael, who's going to go out and raise the money and produce the picture for $5 million? Any, any idea at all? Uh, should we go from the percentage of the budget? Okay. What percentage? 10? 10%? That'd be great. That'd be great. Never. Um, so union rates for the script? Uh, well, yes, you could definitely do that, WGA. I just was talking to somebody about that. Um, but in independent films, what typically happens is you set a floor at the price, you set a ceiling for the price, mm -hmm. and you put a percentage of the budget. Because while I think the picture's going to cost $5 million, he may be able to get it done for three. Or we may attract a major star that pushes the budget up to 10. So why should I sell the script at five million, if the picture actually at a five million dollar valuation, if the picture actually costs ten. So what we try to do is we try to get a minimum, which would be the WGA minimum for a budget of five million dollars, say, and then we get a maximum of some number between five and ten, and that's a percentage of the budget. What's the percentage? Typically, the overall cost of the rights of a picture, which would include underlying rights means if it was based on a book, the underlying rights plus the screenplay plus rewrites should be no more than 5% of the budget of the picture. Typically, it's around 3 or 4%. 5 is a lot. I've done deals at 7, and we have trouble getting the picture financed really? because it's too rich. Yeah, because it's not industry custom. It's outside of the custom. So that's the area. Um, if you are a writer and you are not a member of the Writers Guild, there's nothing wrong with you saying to a buyer, I want no less than the Writers Guild minimum. Even though you're not a member of the Guild. Why? Because they set the market. They know what the market is. They are studios, independent financiers who want to work with Writers Guild members know that they have to pay the minimum. So you as a non-Guild writer can simply say, look, you don't have to pay me my pension and health or any residuals as if I was a WGA. I'm saving you money, but you need to pay me the minimum. And there, you can just look up online on the WGA minimums and you can find a sheet of the minimums. <coughs> and there's a low budget and a high budget and the cutoff is $5 million. So, and what's the price of the option, you might ask, right? We know the price of the, of the picture. I mean, it'd be great for me if I could make a deal with Michael that says, I get no less than 150,000, three percent of five million, and no more than 300,000, three percent of 10 million for the picture, and I get it when I sign the contract. That would be fantastic. But he'll never do that because that assumes that the picture is going to go. He may never raise the money. He may never find a cast. He may never find a director. He may never find a location. There's way too many things out there. So what he does is he buys an option for me. He buys the exclusive right to the property. 
He takes the property off the market so he can go and raise the money and do what he has to do, probably rewrite the script so it works for whoever he's bringing in, and then he can go out and make the movie. What does he pay for that? Remember, I'm talking a minimum of 150 and a maximum of 300. What should he pay? Yeah. What's um, you think he should pay me 150 thousand? No way. Would you pay 150 thousand on these? No. I was going to ask if he's going to make an option. It sounds like it's going to be at like below market rate. Well. Remember, the option is, is the exclusive right to buy the property. It's not actually buying the property. It's the exclusive right to buy the property. And you take the property off the market. Which means you could be really affecting its value if, if you take it off. And a lot of the negotiations are also over the duration of the option and the renewability of the option. Because if I'm taking it off for one and a half, two years, and suddenly you know something's been made that totally destroys the value. It, 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 there are too many unknowns. But, I don't know. Uh, so what, what, what do you guys, what, so what would you as sellers, as a writer, you're a writer, what would you want to sell it for? You mean option it for? Yeah. What would you get when you sign the contract? How much money do you get in your hand? Between five and ten thousand dollars. Great. I'll make a deal with you. Typically it's more. Typically it's closer to ten percent of the minimum purchase. So that, in my case, would be 15000 But if you think he's not going to do anything with it, you're going to charge more to make sure he has risk. Right. Right. The other side of this is is the nature of, of, of who is the offer. I mean, the reality is is that you, you may have something that your friends have seen and said, this, this would be great, and I want to show it to my friend, and this is a friend who wants to make a film for $100,000. Now, suddenly, that option price goes way down, and you might be really excited that this person has an interest, and they could possibly get it made for $100,000. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be, uh, have a huge cast, it's gonna be not run and gun, because you don't wanna do that, but, uh, but then you're probably going to want to if you're going to consider having this made and getting a very small amount, you're going to want the, the, the exclusive window to be very narrow. Slightly off course, but still related question. I've heard that because the script purchasing process is such a pain in the ass legally, that it is one of the biggest reasons why you really don't have to worry much about people outright stealing a, uh, a, a script. Is that true? I'm sorry, say that again? That because the process of purchasing a script is such a pain in the ass, um, and that there's already so many scripts that are already in limbo that have been purchased and are just waiting for the right conditions that, you know, stealing scripts aren't really, that, it's not that common. I've heard that. Is that accurate? I'm not sure I understand why you're asking that question. I actually get this question a lot, and I think it has to do with the fact that the misconception that, quote, stealing an idea is the same as uh, co committing copyright infringement. Okay. And ideas are a dime a dozen. Uh, and and if, you, if you have a great idea, I'm sorry, but uh, somebody else had it too. Of course. Um, so it's really the expression of that idea where, th where we're talking about um, what might be considered uh, copyright infringement, and I think that's very rare. I think Act outright copyright infringement versus quote stealing an idea. Sorry, I should um, clarify. Straight up, just straight, uh, stealing a script. Stealing a script is probably very rare. Yeah, I would think because yeah. it, it's. <laughs> I mean, either you know, the, the people who who can finance it will finance yeah. it if it's that great. I I, um, I I think you've had too many lawsuits over the, over the decades to to show you know to show, I mean, to get a script in front of an executive is a, is a process in and of itself because of, of all these lawsuits in the past. I could be wrong, but I really doubt that uh, too many people are act actually lifting scripts on a regular basis. They lift ideas all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. right. All the 
all the time. Right. But there's no protection for an idea. Right. That's why they would never do it just verbatim. <coughs> well, I had a case where someone actually did do it verbatim. Wow. So my client was out looking for financing about a movie about a Japanese uh, executive. I actually told this story here before. A Japanese uh, a diplomat who was, I forget, in a European country during World War II, and who for 29 days exceeded his authority by granting Jews the right, uh, Chine Sugihara. Do you know the guy? Yes. Okay. So there's a movie about Chine Sugihara. It's called 29 Days. And my client was out talking to people that he knew looking to get the movie made. So he talked to a guy in Japan who actually took the script, took it to a financier in Japan, and made the movie in Japan. I mean, outright. And of course, there was nothing we could do. And of course, when we wrote to all the distributors around the world, it wasn't sold anywhere but in Japan. So uh, it happened. But it was an outright sale. And we still have the property, and we're still likely to go ahead with it one day. But that's a case of the actual script being stolen. Wow. The idea of a movie about Chine Sugihara is not a big deal. It's not copyrightable. This story was insanely compelling. When I read it, I was crying. So it's, you know, you, that's, it happens. It's incredibly rare. Wow. Yes. Um, I've been helping to produce a TV show and we had some troubles with uh, on the uh, finance side because um, the lawyers from the financing side said that r and is always, it has been around. And like, but this is just an idea. Yeah, we and we had to fight for the originality of our idea, even though this concept has been around. So they is it a reality TV? Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a sci-fi. So my question, like you just said that like there is no protection for the idea, but apparently <laughs> it's, well, not, do that. it's not that it's protected. It's that from my perspective, um, this this has to do with. Uh, a reliance on, in the past, on the concept of high concept, where you can just come in and you can give a, a, a one sentence log line and there it is, buy it. Nobody's doing that anymore, right. from my perspective. From my perspective, it's the specificity, it's the detail. You may have an idea that, that doesn't sound particularly original because it's been done in different modes, but if you bring whoever is buying it um, into the details of the story that have clearly never been done before. I think that th this is not about protectability. This is also about everybody's hungering for surprise. Everybody's hungering for an experience that is new. Even though there's nothing new under the sun, th it's the specificity and detail and the amalgam of of, uh, of style and voice and, and, and uh, setting and, and mixing of genres, that's, that's the way you sell it. Uh, but it has nothing to do with protectability from my perspective. Thank you. Yes? I'd like to ask a question about book options, like me optioning a book to for their story and copyright infringement. My issue is I read a book and I love, and that book is basically research about a period of time in history, like, you know, like New York, 1800s, whatever, and there's characters that this writer found in newspaper articles, and I want to take one of those characters and write a story. So I'm thinking, do I need to option that book because I'm actually seeing that idea in her book and, you know, some of the content, or it's like a gray area, like, is that copyright infringement? Do I need the copyright uh, to option the book, or... So, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this from a, a legality and practicality standpoint. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. But, uh, um, so I had this happen with uh, with clients of mine who uh, staged a play um, in in New York City, and um, they did a ton of research on uh, on this historical family. Now, what they didn't know was that in Israel, um, <laughs> one of the one of the kids uh, actually uh, signed over life rights to journalists who were the source of a lot of their research, but not all their research. So, the journalist 
in Israel found out about this play that was inspired by this family and said, we have the life rights to this particular member of the family who is deceased. They're both deceased. <laughs> this brings up, uh, I mean, this is like a, a law school hypo. <laughs> um, and so I had to intercede. And the, the reality is I, I wrote a letter. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a very nice letter well, uh, inviting them to come see that this, while you know the, uh, some of the research that was factual research um, was indeed um, the result of um, the journalistic investigations of this particular journalist. Uh, th this was one of many stories told. It was a, a very small part. Their particular research was a very small part, and in actuality. Uh, they didn't have, you know, they would not win in an American court if they came over here and, and brought a lawsuit. So the reason for that is there's no copyright in a fact. Gotcha. But in, a, so there's, there's, a, there's a Supreme Court case known as Feist, which is about telephone. Folks, don't get me started. But you, the ordering of facts can be copyrighted if there's something really original about it. Um, but we've seen uh, courts are not really um, very sympathetic these days uh, to these kinds of cases. In fact, we had um, we had a, a recent, uh, the Olivia Jersey Boys. Oh, okay. oh yeah, and Olivia de Havilland, who, um, who sued over um, a character based on her calling her sister a bitch. And she said, I would never call my sister a bitch. And, so let me answer the question a little bit differently. There's no copyright in fact. If what you pick up from that book is fact and you present it differently, you don't need the rights. If you want to have, if you want to make sure you don't get a claim from the author of the book, you buy the rights. But you tell them, I don't need the rights from you. I'm going to do this anyway. I just want you to be on my side and help me with this. So maybe I don't need your rights, so I'm just going to buy them from you, but I'm not basing the product on you. I'm effectively buying an insurance policy. And one of the that's benefits. going to be very meaningful to your errors and omissions insurer. Okay. And there are also benefits to that because if you get them on your side, then suddenly maybe they can provide other uh, copyright writable materials such as music or or childhood uh, or things that are not in the book. That's really what happens. I, I bought the rights. I'm sorry. I sold the rights to the life story of Ira Gershwin to. Um, John Guare through Sam Cohn. And he, he didn't need the rights. So we said you have to buy them if you want our cooperation. We got a lot of money, the picture never happened, but you know, that's what happened. Okay, thank you. That's so helpful. so now we're at the point in this discussion where I think that we're ready to take any questions <coughs> we have. Um, if you want to talk about rights more, we can talk about rights. If you want to talk about finance, we can talk about finance. If you want to talk about tax credits, we can talk about tax credits. However you want to take this is fine. Uh, we have another 40 minutes or so. I have a book following question. So I have a client who wrote a book, and I would love to pitch him an idea to make a movie based on his book. Uh, if he says yes, so how do I legally approach that in order for me to write a treatment based on that book and pitch it to, um, to the productions or to the investors? So what kind of you need the exclusive right to turn his book into a motion picture. Exclusive. You need an option. For you. I'd be careful about pitching him your idea. What, what? Well, if you don't have a contract and give him the idea, he can take the idea to somebody else. Well, he's already interested in me pitching him an idea, so. Okay. So if you pitch, if you were to pitch me the idea right now, I could sell it to him because we don't have a contract. Mm -hmm. I would like to buy. You say to him, "I would like to buy your book. I want to turn it into a movie." I have. Don't give him enough that's going to turn it into something that he could then sell to somebody else. Give him a taste because if you give him too much, he'll sell it to somebody else. Basically, Believe me, it happens. Okay. Basically, <laughs> the idea is that. You're, you're essentially flattering the original author on the author's expression of that idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you're going to do something with the author's original idea 
uh, m may really blow back on you anyhow. So what's the better way to approach this? I'd like, I think, I think you have a, a great, uh, a great, great product that I'd love to, uh, I'd love to turn into a movie. So you pitch me that idea as the writer, mm -hmm. and then say, so how long do you need to make the movie happen? How long is my product going to be off the, off the market? How are you going to finance it? When is it going to happen? Does how long am I going to be unable to sell it to anybody else who's done this 10 times before? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to be concerned about as the writer. Okay. That's more important than the idea. To me, as a cynical lawyer, because it's really about the money. People do this not because of the art, they do it because they want to make money. If you can establish to this guy that you have the idea, you have the backing, you have the skill to turn his book into a movie, whether it's for 100000 or $100 million, he'll pay attention to you. That's to me, like I said, as the cynical lawyer, what's going to turn this guy around. So what's the standard option term? Is it 18 months? When I started back you know, in the last century, it was a year to become 18 months with a renewal for another 18 months. Um, you put a renewal in, the renewal has to be in that original clause. Oh, right? yeah. Okay. And here's the other part of that. Um, the custom, it's only custom, it changes from deal to deal. The custom is the 10% that you pay is applicable against the purchase price. So on our example before, the purchase price is 150000 mm -hmm. and I paid 15000 and I exercised that option, Within 12 months, I don't have to pay another 150. I pay the difference between 150 and the 15, so I pay another 135. Mm -hmm. The renewal price is another 15. That's not applicable, oh. typically, because it's another period of time that it's off the market, and the guy hasn't made any money. You haven't made his movie. Mm -hmm. So that's typically, it doesn't have to be, it can be applicable. I bought rights for zero, I've sold rights for zero. I bought rights for a thousand dollars. I've had both payments applicable. I've had neither payment applicable. It's whatever the deal is. I really like your illustration that really the numbers matter. Really, the, the idea. not the numbers. Well, right. The ability right. to the make ability. it happen. Right. 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 Exactly. That's what the credentials matters. of the filmmaker approaching the writer. That's great. My curiosity is: should the writer prioritize the story and? and how translate my curiosity is how can we give them a taste without giving them too much? Like how do you define that? That's why I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer. That's, that's beyond the consultation. I, mean, I, th I think what I said earlier really applies. Um, I love what you did with this project. Yeah, but that's just flattery. It's flattery and also <laughs> kind of an implicit expectation that not much will change. In fact, <laughs> a lot will always change from yeah. a, a novel of to a movie because, because uh, most novels had the internal right. expression and right. now you're externalizing. So the reality is is that playing it safe, I think, is probably the best okay. thing. Gotcha. I could be wrong. Right. But, um, and again, it depends on, I mean, I remember back when I was in college, I was Foolish. Uh, I, I, when I, I, when, I, when, I, when I, when I was, when I was in middle school, I read this incredible book called Vengeance by George Jonas, and I tried for years to, to. Uh, I was in college. I was trying to get the rights, uh, the, the publishing, the, 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 the adaptation rights, and nobody would return my call. And, and then I, I just gave up after a while. And then I came across another uh, phenomenal book that I tried desperately to get the rights to called The Catcher Was a Spy. Um, Vengeance was turned into Munich by Steven Spielberg, and A Catcher Was a Spy was originally bought by George Clooney and eventually uh, bought by Paul Rudd and made with Paul Rudd. The reality is I never had a shot in hell right. of getting <laughs> right. the rights to, to turn I that see. into a movie. Um, and I didn't even know that because nobody was right. out there telling me right. this. I'm not Steven Spielberg and I, I, I'm not Paul Rudd. Um, right. If you think you have a better shot with, with somebody because you know somebody or you have a special connection with that person, that person 
it, it's funny because I was just talking to John about this project that I would love to see made, um, and it, it's it, it's a book that was written by an ophthalmologist. My father's an ophthalmologist. My dad connected me to this guy, and this guy, so for ten years <laughs> there was a recurring option by one of his friends out in L.A. for a dollar. I'm like. I haven't called this guy in a while. He's down in Georgia. I have to give him a call and see if, if he finally gave up on that being turned into a movie. Clearly, it wasn't important to him. Right. And maybe he would, he would, you know, let me pay a thousand dollars to have. That goes option. right to my point. A dollar, a dollar a year is meaningless. No one's going to spend any time working on that picture. Thousand dollars, maybe you'll spend a little time. But ten thousand dollars is money you don't want to lose. So you spend money, enough money that it's going to make the guy hurt and sting if nothing happens. That's the point of it. I don't know what the number is. Depends on the deal. So really what I'm hearing the most from you is we also need to be able to actually produce this. Uh, Fundamentally. Yeah. <laughs> That's really all that matters. Yeah. And how do you get to that place? Well, I have a client who likes to package movies. She finds a script that she likes. She knows everybody at the highest levels. She puts an actor in on it, she puts a producer on it, and then she goes out and tries to finance it. But she'll have an actor attached, and she'll have a producer attached, and or a director attached, and she'll have a package. And she'll go out and be a producer on the property. Gotcha. I don't know if that works. I mean, certainly it doesn't work very well on low-budget pictures. Though. We just did that for a picture. She approached me. She's longtime friends with Liam Neeson. Liam came to her and said, I'm working on this picture with another friend of mine. Do you know anybody? She called me up. She's a client of mine. I said, yeah, one of my clients would probably like this. I sent it to them. The picture just finished shooting last week. So um, it can happen. That's how it happens. You cannot do this alone. That's the other thing you have to know. You, it, there's, if you look at the credits of an end of a movie, it's like a war. It's <laughs> hundreds of people that make the movie. Hundreds. And everybody has an important function. If you look at the big sci-fi movie, it's thousands of people. So you cannot do it alone. Do not think you can do this alone. It is a very collaborative process. And, and if, you know, you have to have the right people around you. You need a you need a lawyer, you need a producer, you need a, a director, you need a writer, you need an actor, you need, a, that's just at the high level. True. So what happens to an investor who puts money in your picture? How many of you have made a picture here? What was, did you do it with your own money or someone else's? I have some of mine and then I got investors. And what, what was the deal you made with the investor? Um, when it sells, they'll get And then if the picture has a profit, what share of profit do they get? They get um, a certain percentage depending upon how much they invested. So that compared to the total investment, if they put in 100% of the cost of the picture, what share of profits would they get? Well, they didn't, so... Um, okay, well, let me, let me answer my own question because I don't need to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, the typical deal is if I invest... 100% of the cost of Michael's picture, 100% of the cost of Michael's picture, a million dollars, let's say. And he sells it to Netflix for $2 million. I will get back my million dollars first. I will get another 20% for the risk I took. That's typically the number. It can be as low as zero. I've seen it as high as 60%, but 20 is the typical number. So I'll get a million two, and then I'll get, of the $800,000 left, half the money. He gets the other half. What does he do with the other half? He pays the actors, the director, and everybody else who participates. So he gets left. He, I get 50% of the profit, because I'm the sole investor in this picture. If I share that with you, and you put up half, and I put up half, we share the 50%, 50-50. It's pro rata that way. We share the 20%. 50-50. That's the standard deal. I've had people at this program think that they get 50% um, of the money from the word go. And it just doesn't happen. The investors get their money back first. You must understand that. They also are entitled to a premium. They took the risk. They took the money out of the bank 
and they put it in your film. If they left it in the bank, they'd only get 2% interest today, but they'd get interest. Or if they left it in the market, well, last year, they'd make money. <laughs> so that's the opportunity cost. That's the 20%. It's very important that you understand that and you respect that. Because if you think you're going to make any other deal, you should be in another business. I'm telling you it's that important. Very cool. I mean, it's <laughs> useful. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I just want to I, I want to emphasize that um, a lot of people that I'm encountering these days are are going in a completely different, you know, down and dirty uh, direction. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Uh, equipment uh, is democratized. Uh, you know, so much of how we express ourselves, distribution can be democratized uh, on, on a level that we had never seen before in the history of media. And so sometimes you have uh, people putting together like a, a web series and it costs next to nothing. And then they put out a, a Kickstarter or um, an Indiegogo or Seed and Spark and we're talking lower numbers, uh, but they're thinking uh, they're getting investors. And I just want to distinguish, first of all, um, unless it's called equity crowdfunding, you, this is donation-based crowdfunding. And you also have to, uh, you, you have to uh, recognize that people are donating to you. They're not investing in your project. Uh, and one of the- That means you don't have to give back the money. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And they should be aware of that. So uh, I, I get very concerned when people start saying, I've got my investors lined up, and they never retained an attorney, and they don't have any, wait a minute, you have to, you have to, you know, we have to discuss exactly what the nature is of the money coming your way, um, what your expectations are, people are now getting sued for fraud, for, uh, related to, uh, to uh, donation-based crowdfunding. There is now equity crowdfunding when, uh, portals, uh, which uh, there hadn't been before 2012, 2014. Um, th the reality is, is um, you have to be very careful when you're talking about money um, and you're talking about shares and sh talking about sharing in the, the returns of this. Um, what you were just saying about not having to give the money back, I think one of the the uh, uh, the most important lessons came from uh, Oculus Rift, which was the the most uh, I think successful Kickstarter in history, and everybody got this incredible <laughs> uh, 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 virtual reality experience uh, with the the basically glorified prototype, and then they sold they got, they got sold to they got, they got sold to Facebook, right? Yeah. And for billions of dollars, and the people who were the quote investors were like, "Hey, all I got was this Oculus, but that's what you, that's what you donated to. You weren't an investor." So being able to distinguish it this way, and so if you're starting off with a web series and you're trying to find your audience, you're not going to be creating these big investment mechanisms right off the bat. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be protecting yourself, that you shouldn't be making the terms of, of who owns what and, and, and who is involved with what and wh what, which money goes where um, very clear from the outset because generally people don't sue people who can't give them money. But if you're successful and you didn't get your ducks in a row beforehand, even if it starts off with a web series, Issa Rae, I mean, I'm sure she didn't think that uh, her web series was going to turn into Insecure. I mean, I'm sure she was very grateful that that she she was able to do this. I sure hope and I assume she had her ducks in a row before moving on to the, the next step. I have a question. Um, I regularly read Nolo Guides. I'm sorry? No, no guys. guys. Yeah. I'm curious if you guys know of a book that might have a really decent amount of the information you guys discussed about today. I wrote a book, but uh, <laughs> I'm not here to promote the book. Um, well, we're not worried about the book. Those are the answers. I didn't bring it. <laughs> it um, 
It, it, it does. It's oh. called The Gasp, and uh, it's how to seize that aha. I don't even remember the name of it. Um, how to seize, seize that aha moment and turn it into a winning business. And it talks about the differences between entities, um, between crowdfunding and investment, between, um, it's not just related to film. I read um, that book. What's that? I read it. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't so, bring you an autograph copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could have a sign up. Sign yeah, I wasn't. Um, I actually created that book uh, specifically because I was getting asked the same question That's over so cool. and over That again. book, is the copy of it, is in the business and uh, legal section of the Smithtown Library. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's you. another book that I just bought by a guy named Skyler Moore. He is a lawyer at a firm called Greenberg Lusker. I think the book is called The Biz. Um, it's in his ninth or tenth edition. And uh, Skyler is one of the leading lawyers in the business. And I think I haven't even opened the book, but it supposedly covers everything we're talking about and more. Um, so that's the investment thing. Um, the other thing you should be aware of is that there are at least 40 states and probably 30 or 40 countries around the world that give you money to make movies, okay? They give you money to make movies. The state of New York will give you 25% of qualifying expenses to make a movie in New York State. But now starting at a million, is that correct? In New York City. Okay. If, uh, if you shoot upstate, or I think actually in Suffolk County, you get a 10% override for certain labor costs. Georgia has a 30% credit. There are lots and lots of places that give you money to make a movie. Arizona just announced, too, uh, 120 million. The tax percent. credit in Belgium is 49% for qualifying expenses. So you have to, the first thing you think about when you're financing your movie is where you're going to shoot and what the tax credit is because you can get that much of the movie provided to you either by the government, depending on the terms, or by a lender when you pledge that commitment to a bank who then gives you a significant portion of that money to make your movie. So a typical independent movie today, that's over X millions of dollars, it's not 200 or 300,000, will be financed somewhere between 15 and 25% by a tax credit 30 to 45 percent by foreign sales and the balance in an equity. The hard question to answer is if the equity, if 100 percent of the equity gets 50 percent of the profit, in my example, the equity is only putting up 30 percent of the picture. Do they still get 50 percent of the profit? That's a negotiation you have with your equity investor. But for them, you would have no movie. That's their position. Your position is, but you're only putting up 30% of the picture. Why should I give you 50% of the profit? And the answer is, whatever deal you can make is the deal you make. There's no right answer. The answer is, you need the money, you make the deal the investor wants. That leads me to the last point that I really want to make to you guys, and that is don't start making your movie unless you have all the money to finish it. Not two-thirds of it, I ah, will fix it in post. None of that crap. If you don't have all the money, the people that gave you the money to produce the picture will be out. Because you won't get the rest of the money. Or the terms on which you'll get the rest of the money will be so bad that they'll never see their money. Because the guy who comes in at the end, the last guy in, says, oh, you need my money to finish your picture? I tell you what my deal is going to be. I don't care what deal you made with anybody else. I get my money first, and I get 30% of the profits. You don't want my money? Okay. That's what he's going to say. Because I've done those deals on both sides. <laughs> By the way, I did think of another book, The Pocket Filmmaker, or The Pocket Lawyer's Guide to Filmmaking, I think it's called. Awesome. It's a good book. And in fact, uh, my up counsel was in, in Los Angeles, he, uh, he teaches entertainment law there, and he uses that as, its text, as his textbook. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. So 
the, the money thing is important for me, for you guys to understand. You need to understand you've got to buy the rights. You need to understand what the investors expect to get when you take money from them. And it's fundamentally important that you not start your movie until you have all the money to finish. I'm telling you. It's incredibly difficult to finish the picture without that. And you need to be smart enough to know, to have the, the wherewithal, the cojones not to start. I know you're desperate to start your movie and make it, but if you can't finish it, there's no part, point in starting it. Yes, another um, person, please. <laughs> Uh, I came in a little late. Apologies for that. Um, sort of a specific scenario, but I want to see how you guys would structure the structure this, if that's okay. Yeah. So let's say you're shooting something where it's based off events that are true, um, and you're getting a wide range of, of I guess interviews or you know uh, people who could speak to it, right? So you're collecting that information and you're pulling that, but you're creating a fictional movie based off of it. How would you structure that deal for those people adding? Whether or not what they add is in the movie, but like you've still collected their insight, uh, is that like a one-time deal, or would you, or would they be, would they have rights after the movie comes out, let's say it's profitable, to hey, that's my story, or that's my insight, or how would you go about with like a large group, like over thirty people or more fifty people, whatever, ever? Hand them an agreement them. before they, uh, before you interviewed them. Uh, there was a Reese Witherspoon, a Reese Witherspoon movie. Um, that, what's that, about Sudan, oh, okay. about the Sudanese children, mm -hmm. and uh, and the producers were, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but some of them, it did do very well, but um, but it was based on interviews with all of these lost children of Sudan, mm -hmm. and the, the non-profit that arranged those interviews, and I believe this was in Georgia, um, I was surprised by this finding by the trial uh, trial judge, but um, said that this was this was a, a creative act. These interviews were a creative act, and they drew on these interviews. And that the, I, I believe this was a summary judgment motion. I wasn't able to find the final disposition. I believe there was a settlement um, of the case, but um, but it's it's at least colorable that. Uh, that the these interviews, the well, the, no, the nonprofit sued the producers oh, okay. uh, for not uh, for actual um, ownership over the over the final product, even though it was a fictionalized piece, because there were elements of those interviews yeah. in the final piece. The, the the simple the simple response is. Make it clear that they have no ownership. This this was a this was a joint copyright case, I believe, and so then they were claiming that there was an intent to make this a joint copyright effort. That there, they had been promised that uh, that uh, they would be you know, partners in the creation of this fictional piece. From the get go, it needs to be made clear, you know, before we put you on camera, um, we can do with this as we please. In consideration of us paying you ten dollars, right? So there's, yeah, right. So there's whatever. That's what I would do. Yeah. That's just if they say no, I want a thousand. They say I'll give you two hundred. I mean, I, I wouldn't give them a royalty because it's a pain in the neck. But I would, I would just pay the money, take it, and then you don't it. It's, it's a one-page release. It's not a big deal. Right. Okay. But before you suck, before you shoot. Yeah. Thank you. And if anybody can. Find out the name of that uh, that movie. It didn't do very well, so I, you know. <laughs> but it's supposed to be. And there are exceptions to every rule. You remember the movie Michael and Me with Roger, Roger Moore? Um, Roger and Me. Roger and Me. Yeah. Michael Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Getting old, what can I tell you? Um, there was a sheriff that went around town trying to convict evict people, and he never signed a release. Um, but he gave oral permission. To do this, he was aware he was being fo followed. He was part of the film, and the judge said, "Look, we saw the we saw the footage. I saw you give permission. This is a documentary, so it is more likely to be in the nature of news. It is not a fictional account like you're doing. So we think that that's sufficient for us to allow you, Mr. Moore, to use the sheriff's material. That, you know, that's right on the edge, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, 
I think there's more, uh, to, right? The pendulum's always swinging, and I know that as long as we've been doing this, we get fair use questions, and we always say it's on a uh, case-by-case basis. And, um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we're gonna see more defamation cases. Um, I, I just, people seem to be suing over defamation for everything. I just found out about today, uh, Casey Close, the, the agent for Freddie Freeman, just uh, uh, sued for defamation for a tweet. Um, there is no, th th this is the problem with law, is that the interpretation of law uh, varies and the pendulum swings and, and sometimes things go one way that every attorney I know says, how could that be? The blurred lines case uh, being um, a, a, a very famous one where every attorney I knew and I've known uh, cannot, still cannot believe that they lost that case. Uh, because there wasn't a, a single note lifted from the original song. There wasn't, it was just inspired. I had students, and I have one of my students here. Um, I have had students submit um, uh, 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 scripts that were inspired by a video game. Now, there's, there's, no, there's no script generally in these video games. But they're using the same characters' names, and they're putting on their script inspired. I said, change the names. It's you know, it, it's you're coming up with ideas based on this idea, which is fine. But if you think you, you can just go around using names, even though names generally aren't copyrightable, but the Batmobile is, uh, even though uh, you know it, it's changed and it, it was based on a Corvette, and you know architectural plans are protectable by copyright. I mean, Fortnite dances, I, I would have thought that those would be protectable because, uh, because choreography is protectable, but no, fair use. The outcomes are not inevitable, from my perspective. Uh, the short answer to that is don't rely on fair use. Do not. <laughs> yes? Um, I just wanted to let you know the movie with Reese Witherspoon is a good life. A good life? Yeah. No, good life. A good life. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't do very well, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so right now you're getting free legal advice. You gotta have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I also came in late, so I apologize if this was covered earlier, but I feel like lately there's been a lot of films or series based on figures who are in the news, and it, it seems like sometimes they get the rights from those people sometimes they don't. And sometimes when they do, it's controversial because there are laws like people who have been convicted of a crime can't profit from it, you know, and, but they've been paid for the rights to their story or things like that. So it seems very inconsistent. It is. What's your question? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Is, is there a rhyme or reason that I'm missing? or? Is well, we there? did cover that before oh, sorry. in a way, but it's okay. Um, there's no copyright in a fact, okay, that uh, John, John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln is a fact, right? And the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald killed John Kennedy is a fact. Um, those are also public figures, so to some degree you need less rights from them because uh, in order to defame them, to his point, you have to have a reckless disregard for the truth. Um, so it's easier to write stuff that might not be 100% right. But if you want to make a movie about someone who was alive at one point, and you stick very, very closely to the truth, technically you don't need their rights. But if you get their rights, you would buy those rights, not just for the rights, but for the ability to talk to them about things you don't know and things you couldn't find out about and other material that would be useful to making your movie more realistic, more challenging, more sellable, whatever. And also, uh, for the right to not be sued. Um, I mentioned briefly before, uh, there was a long running case, the Jersey Boys case. Um, and this was kind of a crazy case that was, that lasted close to a decade because, um, because 
one of the members, one of the seasons uh, of, of Frankie Valli and the uh, Four Seasons. Um, his, his, um, he had a, a ghost writer uh, write um, his life story that never got published. Um, the guy died, his widow uh, sued Jersey Boys partially because there was a scene in, in the Jersey Boys that was made up. It didn't happen. And this was in the unpublished manuscript of, of, of this ghost written autobiography. In the end, they found, uh, I, I believe, uh, it all went Frankie Valley and, and the Four Seasons way and the producers of the Jersey Boys. But this took a decade. And, and part of it had to do with this concept of de minimis. The, the, this was such a small part of the story, and the rest was fa based on factual events that there, there wasn't enough to show that uh, any meaningful copyright infringement. Again, um, the more sources you have, the, the, the more likely things are going to go your way with uh, public figures and public events and so on and so forth. If you're relying on one historical uh, uh, source and part of that is actually not reflecting the truth, you're, you're, you probably would be uh, better served um, getting in touch with the author of that one source that you have. But to defame them, you have to be portraying them in a negative light, right? So just because it's something's changing the truth, if it's not negative, does that matter? Or? No, it's just a false light. It's not negative. It's false. So Donald Trump was always mad that people said he wasn't worth $10 billion. He's only worth six. Or maybe he was actually worth 50. Who knows? But the, it's a false light. They're only going to care if you portray them in a negative way compared to what they want. I mean, if you, told, if you said Donald Trump was worth $50 billion, he'd be happy. Right? But that's a false life. In theory, he could sue for defamation. He's not going to care. And, and again, this, this is an issue of like uh, outrageousness. Um, one of the concepts of uh, false light comes from uh, the baseball pitcher uh, Warren Spahn, who, um, who there was a children's book written about him, and it said that he got a purple heart. And he was very modest, and, and he, didn't, he wanted to stop the publication of this, and, and he succeeded for an invasion of his right of privacy, uh, and this spawned this idea of, uh, of uh, false light. The reality is you have to do your due diligence and make sure that things aren't made up and, uh, and, 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 and see if you can get corroboration, try to get multiple sources, and whether it, it reflects poorly or not, uh, you know, some people truthfully look, come off looking bad. And this is why I personally have, personally have a big problem with uh, non-disparagement clauses in, in contracts. You could, you could contract that away, but I mean, if, if something's truthful and still is considered disparaging, uh, there's nothing defamatory about that. Tax credit. I'm sorry. What is tax credit? What is a tax credit? Um, in Puerto Rico, for example, if you are making a movie, um, Puerto Rico will give you a credit against your income tax equal to, say, 30 percent of the money you spend in Puerto Rico. So if you're making a 10 million dollar movie, they're going to give you a credit against of three million dollars against what you uh, against your income tax that's due. So if I had a tax bill in Puerto Rico of $3 million, I would pay zero because it's a credit against what I owe. But since I'm an LLC, which pays no income tax, I have absolutely no use for this credit, none. I have to sell the credit to someone who can use it. So I'll, I'll sell it to Coca-Cola, or I'll sell it to IBM, or I'll sell it to the electric utility company, I'll sell it to somebody who needs a tax credit. So if it's a $3 million tax credit, which will reduce their tax bill by $3 million, they're not going to pay me $3 million for it. They're going to pay me less. Because why would they pay me $3 million for something that's worth $3 million? It doesn't make any sense. 
they'll pay me less. So they'll pay me 90 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar or something like that, and they'll make that difference, and you, as the filmmaker, will get that 80 or 90 cents on the dollar. That's a tax rate. It's complicated. In New York, it's even more complicated. There's a blog on my website about how to turn a New York State tax credit into cash. It's very complicated. Yes? One of the things that's fascinating because I'm coming from Canada and we have our own tax credit system. Um, so who can you sell it to? If, if you don't have a use for it, if you find somebody who does, who are those people? Who, who well, they're brokers. They're so brokers. brokers. Okay. In Puerto Rico, actually, the Film Commission will sell it for you. Oh. They will act oh. as a broker. Okay. They want people to come there and do it. That's just Puerto Rico. Right. In Georgia, there are banks that come. In, in New York, if you have a million dollar tax credit, you will get a piece of paper before you start shooting that says you have a million dollar tax credit. You will take that to a bank and they will lend you 80 cents on the dollar against that, against yeah. your delivery. That's what will happen. You can do that at a million dollars and up. Under that, you got to go to a private lender. In Georgia, you don't get that piece of paper. You don't know what the credit's going to be. So if you think you're going to get a million dollar credit, the lender has to look at your expenses, look at your budget, and say, yeah, I agree, you're going to get a million dollar credit. If you get less, I'm the lender, I'm out i got to find another place to get more mm -hmm. money. If it's more, I'm happy because then I'm covered in my interest. But that's a risk that the lender and the, and the borrower work out in Georgia. Yeah. Each state is different. New York mm -hmm. could be the most complicated of any jurisdiction. And in Georgia, you know, a lot of people say, OK, I'm going to do an independent film in Georgia. Uh, th 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 seeing, you know, made in Georgia after mm -hmm. every television program. I mean, you see the peach. Like, mm -hmm. Constantly, right? You're probably not going to get that tax credit that the studio is getting. I mean, the reality is, is that uh, from talking to producer and lawyer friends that have tried uh, on something low budget, they're they're just not getting what they think they're going to get because they heard, oh, George is the place to go. What's your barrier for low budget to high budget over here? Well, there's an ultra low budget, mm -hmm. so it's funny because a number of my uh, a number of my uh, students worked on a project, and um, it was an ultra low budget. I believe ultra low budget is under three hundred. Is that right? SAG ultra low budget is two hundred thousand cash, three hundred thousand deferred, okay. up to five hundred thousand. That's SAG. Okay. <laughs> low budget at the WGA is under five million. Low budget at the, at the DGA, I think, is under 10 million. Depends is the answer. <laughs> and and if you're, you're, you know, a lot of people here well, could conceivably make a feature film for $50,000 yep. and um, and be able to to use. I'm, I'm right. Yeah, no. <laughs> We've done it before. Uh, you're right. People have done it. Um, <laughs> 25. Funny. I mean, Clerks. We remember Clerks, and that was done on 35. No, Super 16 on black and white, and it was $22,000. 93. 93. <laughs> Which is like what? Clerks 3 is coming out. Yeah, yeah. That costs like 5 million. <laughs> but, you know, numbers are, are very difficult mm -hmm. to pin down because, you know, I, I, I remember when I started here, God knows how long ago. Um, you know, Brothers McMullen, they were like, what was that made for? It was, it was something obscenely $10,000. Like, $10, mm -hmm. But they, then, then they got the sound mix, they got, you know, El Mariachi, 7000 But again, <coughs> um, it, the, it, it really depends on the numbers you're dealing with, and it also depends on who your audience is and your likelihood. Look, if you're going to make a, a, a documentary, uh, for you know ten thousand dollars and and you found your audience and and you crowdfunded half of it you'll probably make some sort of money it, it, it really depends on every case by case scenario and the 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 buying audience the, 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 the you know people have gotten creative with how they distribute how they exhibit um, I mean, for those of you who are here, who have films here, there's nothing better than being in a movie theater and seeing your picture up on a big screen. Uh, it's different than seeing it on your phone. It just is. So um, all these deals and, and all these numbers, it, it depends on what your priorities are and, and 
um, how it fits into your bigger vision for the future. Thank you. I should finish your answering your question. A tax credit is one way states and governments give you money, the other is a rebate. Credit is what I talked about, where you take it and you credit your income tax bill. The rebate is when the government writes you a check. They actually write you a check. The state of New York writes you a check. It takes three years, but you get a check. <laughs> How do you get paid without writing a mean letter? Yeah. You get paid in advance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I, I, I will also <laughs> start working as a producer for somebody, you want 20% when you start. You want some money when you start. And when I say start and paid in advance, I'm not kidding. Get paid in advance. When you take on new clients, do you get paid in advance? I do. Oh, so do I. That's the answer. It's no joke. It's really cool because it doesn't seem like anybody actually is doing it. That's just the people you only, right. only, <laughs> only creative people, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Creative <laughs> people undervalue their own worth, and this is a real problem. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me just say one more thing. I think making movies is the hardest thing to do on the planet. If any of you ever have a question, don't hesitate to call me or email me. My website is markjacobson.com. I'm available. I only have one phone number. It's right here in my pocket. It's on the website. Just call, I don't mind. If you ever give me papers to look at, then we have to talk. But I'm happy to talk on the phone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna have to everybody to clear the space just temporarily so we can set up for our DP meet and greet, which starts at five o'clock. Mm.